Well, my friends, I am Ed Tick, a member of our board, and I'm very honored and pleased to introduce my, another distinguished elder and explorer of the soul, my dear friend and soulmate in this work, Dennis Patrick Slattery. Um, in the good Irish tradition, he is Dennis Patrick. <laughs> um, Dennis uh, is uh, not uh, presently, he's an emeritus distinguished professor of mythological studies uh, from Pacifica University. He's uh, an extraordinary man who explores the full range of our mythic consciousness, and I'll share uh, of that in a few moments. But I do invite you to uh, visit Dennis's blog, DennisPatrickSlattery.com, where you can find his poetry, his paintings, his blogs, and much information about his work. Uh, Dennis and I met at Pacifica University. We were both lecturing there. And truly, we sat spellbound before each other's words. We immediately felt it was Mutual recognition it is a form of love at first sight. Uh, and in Dennis's words, we immediately recognized uh, kindred souls who understand the value of myth and mythic consciousness. Dennis truly lives in that consciousness. Dennis is the author of approximately 30 volumes of works of six of them are poetry, uh, his scope is enormous, and I do urge you to look at his books. Uh, they fill a whole bookshelf in my library and in my own scholarship and work. Uh, I use Dennis's uh, work very much. Um, he's contributed enormously to my own evolution in the archetypal and mythological world. He has a book on the Odyssey. He has a book on Moby Dick. He has a book on the wounded body and the mythic and archetypal dimensions of our afflictions and illnesses. He has many books that are collections of essays on literature, psychology, the arts, culture, and they are all beautifully and meaningfully integrated as uh, other previous leaders in our field like Joseph Campbell and uh, James Hillman all did. Dennis is in that field and is of that company. I also testify to you that I've worked with some of Dennis's students even behind his back. They all praise Dennis as a beloved teacher and elder who truly helped set them on their life course and help them discover their own personal myths and mythic journeys as Dennis will be helping us all do uh, tonight. Uh, I want to mention his newest book. It's impossible to keep up with this man's extraordinary productivity, um, but his newest book is called The Way of Myth. Um, stories, the, the subtle wisdom of stories. So please take a look at that as well. I invite you tonight to take Dennis's wisdom and presence deeply into your souls. And before he starts, I would like to, with your permission, my brother, re read you one of Dennis's poems that will set us on the mythic journey that Dennis will lead tonight. This poem is called Dream the Prize. See what you have, dive before the watercourse, before the watercourse shrinks into shallows. Find the thread that unravels back to the shirt you are wearing. Travel south of anger, west of resentment, north of desire, and east of envy. Find the center of your own silence. Use every word. Use every word as if it were a mud brick you shaped with your own hands. Stack them carefully. Celebrate your birthday every day, save the one you were born on. At night, find a bridge to sleep beneath. Watch for the prize. It will float in the dark, silent Silk River just feet from where you dream. In the morning, bathe in its glossy silence 
and feel new skin packing you in like a gold bar swaddled in blue satin. Welcome and bless you, Dennis. Thank you for your great contributions to all of us. Help us shape our myths, my brother. Thank you so much, Ed and Erica, uh, for inviting me and for Andy's uh, just a generous soul in helping me uh, relax around Zoom teaching, <clears throat> which um, I realized uh, a couple of years ago with so many others, if I'm going to be doing any teaching, it's going to have to be learning how to do uh, how to work Zoom and how to create at least modestly coherent uh, PowerPoints. And so those are in process, but I'm doing I'm doing better. Ed, I what an ex I, I just have to share this with all of you. What an experience to hear one's poems or poem. Uh, and that's one of my favorites, read to one. It just gave me chills because um, I recognized it and I didn't recognize it. It was familiar and it was new. And I forgot about that ending, which I think is one of the better endings of uh, poems that I've written. So thank you, um, right out of the gate, giving me an experience of a mythic consciousness by your voice reading it. So much gratitude, Ed. Now, I want to just mention to all of you, <coughs> normally when I present, I'm working off of a, um, off of a script, and I have pieces of it, but um, something didn't, something didn't pull together <clears throat> in the normal way that I'm, that I normally present. And I decided to be okay with that because this business of personal myth is so uh, paradoxical. It's so diverse. It's, um, it's so protean and slippery that I thought, okay, pull pieces together that you feel the audience would benefit from hearing and participate in. And that's the second point. When, uh, Eric, when I was talking with Erica before you all were admitted, uh, she mentioned that as a group, you seem to enjoy um, a looseness in the sense of non-formal, perhaps, and um, a feeling of being invited in uh, to the speaker's work. So I'm, I'm opening that up at the front end that as we begin to move through some of these pieces, if you'd like to comment as we go, rather than gathering it up at the end, uh, I'm perfectly comfortable uh, with that. Because this work on mythology and mythopoetics is just an ongoing, and I'll work on it until the day I die, because it still has uh, arrows for me. It still has psychic energy for me. And not that Ed and I are having a competition in poetry reading, <laughs> although that could be an interesting <laughs> uh, a session in itself. I wanted to share with you a poem that I bet many of you know, and it's by one of my favorite poets, Jalila Don, Jalala Dean, I'm practicing his name, uh, Rumi. And you may know that he was born in Afghanistan on September 30th of 1207. And he died December 7th, 1273. What excites me about that when I learned his dates is that for a limited number of years, Dante Alighieri and Rumi 
existed at the same time on the planet. Dante's dates being 1265 to 1321. When I learned that, it gave me great comfort in thinking that they existed at the same time for a handful of years. So I thought this poem by Rumi would be a good place to start. And it's called, appropriately enough for what I want to speak about, Unfold Your Own Myth. Who gets up early to discover the moment light begins? Who finds us here circling, bewildered like atoms? Who comes to a spring thirsty and sees the moon reflected in it? Who, like Jacob, blind with grief and age, smells the shirt of his lost son and can see again? Who lets a bucket down and brings up a flowing prophet? Or like Moses, goes for fire and finds what burns <clears throat> inside <clears throat> and finds what burns inside the sunrise. Jesus slips into a house to escape enemies <clears throat> and opens a door to the other world. Let me take a sip of uh, tea. Solomon, <clears throat> Solomon cuts open a fish and there is a gold ring Omar storms in to kill the prophet and leaves with blessings. Chase a deer and end up everywhere. An oyster opens its mouth to swallow one drop. Now there's a pearl. A vagrant wanders empty ruins. Suddenly, He's wealthy. And then here's the turn. But don't be satisfied with stories, how things have gone with others. Unfold your own myth without complicated explanation. So everyone will understand the passage. We have opened you. Start walking towards shams. Your legs will get heavy and tired. Then comes a moment of feeling the wings you've grown lifting. Now, I just love that poem because it starts off with this series of stories and questions. It's about who. It's about what. But after a point, Rumi seems to be suggesting, set those stories aside so you can begin to unfold your story, your narrative. And when that happens, you'll grow wings and lift yourself up into, I think, another dimension and it's the dimension of mythology itself. That's what I feel. And there's so much that we could speak about, but I wanted to start with that because it's just a brilliant um, invitation for all of us to mine the myth and to mine the myth that we are. And that's what I wanna do this evening with, with you. Um, I've always loved reading the stories of gods and heroes in world mythologies. But only when I came on the work of Joseph Campbell and taught a course in his ideas for years in the mythology program at Pacifica, did I begin to think more about personal mythology, its value and influence in our individual lives. And I have a couple of pieces that I'll share with you after from Jung, when he began to wonder 
what myth it was that he was living. And he realized, uh, and this is uh, well into his life and his professional life, that he didn't know. I'll share that uh, passage with you uh, in a bit. But um, some years ago, this is a little bit of history, and I want to share with you that when I was reading something of Campbell, this image came to me, and I want to share it with you, <clears throat> because he was always interested uh, in the interface between history and mythology. And when I was reading him or rereading him, I don't know if I was preparing for a class to teach or I was just reading it to fill out my own understanding of his thinking. This image came to me of a jacket and the inner lining of the jacket was of a like a satin or a silk, uh, but it, it helped to give the sleeves of the jacket and the rest of the jacket a, a shape. Uh, and that shape was held really by the interior lining. And I thought, what if, what if we were to consider that the outer jacket is history and the inner sleeve is myth? So I'd like you to just entertain that idea. And, you know, I can't prove any of this, which is why I can just say it freely to you and we can work it and extend it and amplify it. But it came to me that, that myth is the inner sleeve of history, that myth is what is eternal and history is what is temporal, but they, but they fit into the same um, outfit, if you will, tailored to support each other and for one to reflect um, and um, shape the form of the other. And I've, I've hung on to that because it, it seems to me to be true, that relationship between the two. So years ago, I began to make presentations on personal myth. I'd never even thought about doing that for all the years that I taught of classics in literature to teachers and adult learners and undergrads and graduate students at other places. But I thought this is a real opportunity and I felt a calling to do it. And I was able to convince myself to stop worrying about failing in doing it. Just do it. So I began to put out feelers and different groups invited me in and I was, I was making it up as I went. Uh, it was really jazzy, jazzy in the sense that I was riffing and I was improvising and I didn't know if there was going to be an ending. And I suffered through the cacophony and I also enjoyed when things were harmonious. But what I, what I found that I had some knack in doing is that I kept inventing new questions for participants to respond to in short writing meditations. And I, I felt like I wanted to get rid of the word writing exercises, which felt too uh, muscular, too much gymnasium, and maybe too much ego. But when I decided on the word meditation, writing meditations, it just seemed to change the atmosphere and for the better. So I began to call them writing meditations. And I encouraged uh, my participants, if they could let go of the laptop and write cursively, write in longhand. And I think there's a particular magic in cursive writing, which I have learned uh, over the last few years in many schools is no longer taught. So the teachers have to, if they're going to use the blackboard, they have to print. So they've lost that, that kind of spiralic quality of the movement of the body rather than 
the fingertips hitting the keys. And it also slows things down. And I found that, and I would ask people how it goes. If they had some uh, physical challenge, just use the laptop, it's fine. But if they could step away from it and return to cursive writing, it would be uh, an addition to what the content of the writing is. So then having accumulated dozens of meditation prompts, I took my folders, and this is over several years, and I had no idea or thought about writing a book about writing myth. But I was enjoying this new kind of teaching and a different relationship with uh, the participants. So I kept doing it. So after I'd accumulated folders of writing prompts, and I asked um, participants uh, at different times, if I could have their um, response. And if they wanted to be anonymous, fine. If they wanted to be named, fine. But I thought I would gather some participants' responses. Again, no thought of a book, but I felt like I wanted to organize this in a way that I could amplify it, but repeat it, repeat the ones that work, let go of the ones that, uh, kind of fell flat. And so I took all of these folders years ago with me to my favorite monastery in Big Sur. It's a Benedictine monastery called New Kamal Dali. And uh, for the locals, it's simply called, or if you went on and Googled it, it's called simply the Hermitage. And there's about 20 to 24 uh, Benedictine priests and brothers there. And I would escape there when I taught at Pacifica. It's 200 miles from Santa Barbara up to uh, Big Sur, where it was. And I would stay for four nights and five days and leave there much more at peace and much more centered and much clearer about what I wanted my life to be and to continue being. So here's what happened, and I'm talking to you all about how this came into the world. And I've not written anything in the way that this book um, in many ways created itself. And it's a communal book. My name's on the cover, but there are so many voices in there that are from the participants' uh, responses. And I think that's one of the strongest parts of the book is the participants' meditative responses uh, to some of these prompts. So I have a tendency pretty regularly for the last 30 years of getting up at four to 4.15. And maybe I should have been a monk, but that, that life of the monk and the solitary and yet communal and sacramental, uh, still very uh, appealing uh, to who I am. So one morning I got up and I made the bed and I got some hot coffee. And I thought, well, let's see what I have here. So I had no grand plan or pattern to follow, but I wanted simply to arrange them in some coherent order. Now, you'll see that the language I'm using right now <laughs> is the language of myth itself. I was seeking a coherent order to this disparate piles of uh, writing prompts. So I took each meditation question and dropped them in the bed in piles of subject matter. Well, this one's writing about this. This goes here. Then I stood back, absolutely astonished. They had fallen into nine separate and distinct clusters, which are the nine chapters of this book. And I want to read them to you. The first is Meditations on Myth and Mythic Consciousness. 
The second, engaging the myth that that writes you, R-I-T-E-S. The title is Writing Myth. I'm playing with trying to capture that writing itself is a ritual process and that cursive writing is, is, uh, is it, it, it advances meditation. This has been my experience and, it, and I, it's, it's shared by many of the participants. Next one, the writing self. Next, writing the aesthetic self. The next chapter, writing the wounded self. Next, writing through the embodied self. Next chapter, writing the self as and other. Next chapter, writing the spiritual self. Next chapter, reviewing and writing the pattern self. And that's it. Now, what I found so delightful and staggering was that unbeknownst to me, my unconscious or the unconscious was crafting and shaping this book. And I was unaware of its power and its aesthetic in shaping it. So when I returned to Texas from where I was commuting to teach at Pacifica, I contacted a number of the participants for permission to use their responses to individual questions. And it was interesting. Some said, yes, you can use it. Don't use my name. Others said, yes, you can use it. Please identify me. And so I obliged each of their requests. So the book was published 12 years, 10 years ago. I did not begin even with a notion of a book, as I've mentioned to you, gathering out of the many retreats I had conducted. But something mythopoetically was taking place in me and didn't show itself in consciousness until that sorting, because that was a very conscious and kind of ego uh, driven, which was fine. I needed the ego then to give it uh, uh, some, some shape. But in spite of myself, the book was taking shape more unconsciously than consciously. It was organizing itself, taking shape in another terrain than conscious intention. I wanna say it to you this way. It was forming itself mythically. Or better said, mythopoetically. It confirmed for me not only how our creative processes, our creative activities may be stirring us all the time, and then one day it surfaces. Like, uh, let's say, a white whale might surface or breach to encourage us to make something of what we have been musing over. So I'm using that old Greek word poesis in its original sense to make or shape something into a coherent form. That's what poesis is. It could be cross-stitching. It could be rebuilding a 1947 Ford. Uh, It could be be, um, any artistic or It could be making and shaping a human life with meaning. That's mythopoesis. Then as I began shaping an introduction, an event occurred that sharpened how I should begin. And if I can relate that story to you, and I know that you present here could tell an analogous story from your own life where something was uh, roiling and moving and 
finding its, uh, its attributes, its elements, and you are busy earning a living, sleeping, preparing a meal, and it's all happening in the basement. This is how I begin the book, and let me just pause and uh, take a little of this tea. Here's the story. Several years ago, in the parking lot at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpinteria, California, where I had at that time been teaching for 20 years, I experienced a moment where a shared, where a shard, an important shard of my own myth surfaced through a voice within me, but it was a voice other than me. It was within me and it was other than me. It was early morning. I like to set up my classroom about 45 minutes before students come in. And for those of you who might not know, <clears throat> when you step into the classroom at Pacifica, you had better be prepared for the seven hours that that class takes place in. Classes at Pacifica meet three times for the quarter. So you have three seven hour blocks to get it all out there and worked on and, um, and transformed. So, uh, and I was good at it. And I began, to, I, after a couple of years, I began to love that length of time for going deeper. And because the adult learner had mastered some of those disciplines of paying attention, staying on point, uh, a bit more stamina, uh, it was an absolute delight. And they paid me, which was even better. But I could, if I would had been wealthy, I would have taught for nothing. The joy of it was um, uh, beneficial in itself. But I had a mortgage, so there we are. So, teaching eight hours, seven hours. My habit was to bring books that might be of interest to the students, my own uh, text to deploy in the classroom, the reading <clears throat> that we were scheduled to work on, <clears throat> folders stuffed with notes both handwritten and typed, perhaps a newspaper article or a magazine article that I had snagged along the way. I may have read it on the plane and thought, hmm, this would work today in the class. Um, to emphasize a point or idea I wanted to develop. I also shared text that had influenced my own thinking and writing. So as always, my groaning, two-wheeled case with an extended handle was overburdened with options and bulging to the point that the class had long ago ruptured, victims of my ambitious desire to widen the contours of the class material. I found myself asking, as I rolled this mass across the driveway, why I had once more thought as much as brought as much as three times the amount of material I could ever traverse, even in 16 hours. The response, now at 7.30 a.m., startled me and stopped me in my tracks. From some wise source within. You know, yes, it was in, but the sense, the sensate thing that I'm experiencing right now is that came from over my right shoulder. From some wise source, I heard a responsive assertion, which consisted of three succinct words. Excess is Access. Access is access. I paused and smiled at this revelation and humbly offered thanks 
to the primal source that helped me understand my behavior. When I teach, I need to bring too much to the classroom because then I have the luxury of sorting out, letting that go, picking up this. And that, those three words are still a cornerstone of my personal myth. I need too much of in order to have enough of. That's, that was a mythic revelation. It did, I believe now that the voice is geni genius uncoiled from the core of my personal myth. It did not arise from my ego. It came from a deeper, more resonant place in me, the soul and source of who I am. It carried an impersonal, or better said, an objective quality about it so that I knew it was in me, but not of me. Myths, I considered, even if personal, maintains their own autonomy, but more often than not, lets us in on their patterns if we are open and receptive to receive them. This last observation defines the purpose of this entire book, writing myth, mythic writing. Now I'm going to share with you two ideas here. A myth I began to discern is a manner, even a style of being present to the world's matter, as well as to interior thoughts and ideas and emotions. So myths, myths are stylistic. They have their own style. A myth, I would add, is like a fulcrum. It's balancing two realities simultaneously and all the time. The external world that I meet day to day, you meet day to day, and the inner psychic world that has its own objective nature, not needing me to exist, but is rather working itself through me and that I must come to a fuller awareness of, to have a fuller knowledge of what I am, not just who I am. Myths give us insights into what we are and to who we are. Second point I want to share with you, which is part of the introduction of the book, that a myth <clears throat> includes a way, a via, or a roadway, a path that allows things of the world to present themselves to me in a particular style of intellectual and emotional presence. It's intellectual and emotional. There's a confluence of thought and feeling. One of its means of expression, then, is through ritual behavior. My dragging that bulging, broken, snapped, two-wheeler, uh, battered suitcase that I'd probably put 10,000 miles on across from my car to the classroom was a ritual. And I didn't understand how deep that ritual was until I was given those three words. Excess is access. So ritual behavior, I want to get that into the mix here. As my luggage, all those, as my luggage, lugging all those tomes within my roller suitcase advanced its expression and allowed it to emerge on that particular morning 
as a revelatory presencing. It was a revelatory presencing. And thank goodness my ears were open to hear it because I would have missed that particle of the myth that I am. Last thing I'll mention, my personal myth then, your personal myth then, I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, and we'll speak about assumptions uh, before we're finished, is in large measure the consequence of how I structure my images of reality based on patterns that I have developed from my life experience, as well as deeper pre-existing arrays embedded in the psyche of us all. May I read that again? Uh, it's, a, it's a busy sentence. My personal myth then is in large measure the consequence of how I structure my images of reality based on patterns that I've developed, knowingly or unknowingly, from my life experiences, from my history, as well as deeper pre-existing arrays embedded in the psyche of us all. So the paradox here, I believe, is that my personal myth is paradoxically also a communal myth or participates in the larger community of mythologies. But I think to the extent that I'm faithful to being aware of my myth's consequences. Yeah, yeah. Let me, may I just pause here and see where you are with regard to what's been said? Let me, let me just pause, give you a, a reflective moment and then, uh, and then uh, Andy uh, can call on you. Yeah, because it's important for me as it is for any speaker to get a sense of, you know, how's it coming across? What does it make you thinking of? Are, are you, are you uh, suddenly realizing an analogy in your life? Any of that, please. Let's go ahead, to, uh, Zipia. Yeah, thank you. A quick, uh, very basic foundational question. Um, can you please uh, say um, how you are using the word myth and what specifically you mean by personal myth? I think I know what you mean, but I just <laughs> want to make sure. Thank you. Would you? I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, am I pronouncing Sivia? Sivia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sivia. Thank Great. you very much. May I ask you, though, because you mm -hmm. have an inkling, you, know, mm -hmm. you have an inkling. Yes. What is your inkling of personal myth? My inkling is personal of personal myth is seeing the larger pattern and arc of my life's story and connecting it with an archetypal myth. For example, I connect very deeply with two stories right off the top of my head, the Demeter story and the biblical matriarch Sarah's story. Yeah, so my personal myth is my personal embodiment of those archetypal patterns Yeah, is how I say it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Two things occur to me. One, the word myth and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sucking on these lozenges to help my throat because I don't want to keep clearing my throat and sounding old or something. The word myth comes from muthos, which is connected in the, in the ancient Greek to mouth. So that when one speaks, it kind of doesn't matter what the subject matter of one speaking is. One is speaking one's myth as one is describing something, remembering something. So myths for me are very linguistic. They're the, the words we choose to make a point and the words we choose given who the audience is that we're addressing. 
one person, one person, 200 people. So muthos is, is, is mythos. And it has to do with the speaking, but I would also say it's with uh, what I, not only what I write, but how I write, uh, how I express myself in uh, my paintings, uh, my pottery, they all carry the residues of my myth uh, within them. Does that help? Sylvia? Oh, <laughs> yes, sorry, I had to unmute. Yes, absolutely. Um, That's very interesting. It's a very interesting um, complimentary uh, definition. Thank you. And I'm going to I'm going to use your uh, really fine, basic, and you can't beat basic questions. Uh, to add one other piece here from uh, the Greeks that I have been interested in for thirty years, and that is the notion of mimesis. When things are mimetic, I'm thinking of the figures, <clears throat> uh, the biblical figures that you uh, identify yourself with. That's a mimetic move. In other words, there's something in you that resonates. And if, if I'm wrong, Sylvia, you, I want you to say, well, that's not quite it, please. But this is, this is where I am with what you asked, that, that these figures live within you. And in some way, well, no, you, you, I think you said it. They, they, uh, I embody them. You see, it's, it's, for me, the analogy is reading these great works of literature and meditating on them <clears throat> and asking myself, and I would suggest to my students, you know, when you read these works, we would read, for example, Homer's Odyssey, uh, Melville's Moby Dick, and Toni Morrison's Beloved. And that was the class. We spent seven hours on each one of those wonderful uh, epics. And I would ask them, you know, pay attention to what calls you to underline it. What do you feel like you want to write something in the margin? What is there about a, a passage you read that you say, you know what, I need to read that out loud. Because it's, it was my belief, and still is, that those moments when things heat up, in the cauldron of the text, that's it's 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 touching up against your myth, and you want to pause. Or as you're reading, suddenly a memory from 15 years ago pops into your mind. That's my medic. So it's the imagination seeking its analogies. So I love your illustration. It helped me pull in my nieces, and I didn't have to make up a uh, an example because you gave it to me. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Please. Go ahead, Erica. Hi, Dennis. Um, Hi. I want to bring attention to the embodied myth, like you were just saying, because I do a lot. I, I, one of the ways I find myself into the inner world is through movement, the body, and I work in a very embodied way. And I've been working a lot with the person, with the um, personally and professionally with the dark mother in the last mm. five to 10 years, I don't know. And right. um, I had an experience yesterday. So I had a very dark mother and I was sitting on the floor and there was a baby sort of right in front of me and my hands became the dark mother. My mm. hands became claws. And they were, and I was set, I was uh, hissing and I was, my hands were coming around the baby and I stayed and stayed and stayed with that. And suddenly the hands began weaving, mm. began weaving and they began to weave a cocoon, a, a papoose around the baby. Mm. And I realized it was grandmother spider that I had oh. incredibly, some powerful experiences with spiders in my past. So I just want to bring that the myth comes from the body. Too. Yes. Yes. No, beautifully said. And <clears throat> you remind me, and I use this book a couple of times in the Campbell class, and it's called Bios and Mythos. And it's a series of transcriptions from Joseph Campbell working with Stanley Kellerman, right. body therapist, and 
it's it's a magnificent um, interchange. Uh, Campbell speaking. Kellerman asks him. Campbell brings this up, and it it even to the point where Campbell believed that certain body types gravitated to certain plot lines mm-hmm. of narratives, and so there was a there was a there was a body type that seemed to lean towards epics and another one towards comedy and another towards tragedy. So I couldn't agree more. And there, yeah, there's a book over there on the shelf. I'm not going to get up and get it where um, uh, I'm not going to remember name, but it's something on body intelligence and the woman that wrote it was using cases of helping women wounded, uh, uh, cancerous, uh, with certain narratives that she believed or had had evidence for actually having healing properties in the body through the narrative a particular kind of, I just find this whole area of body and myth, and it's part of what prompted in an unconscious way uh, for me to spend seven and a half years writing The Wounded Body. Mm. Because I asked myself, what have the poets been telling us about being embodied? Mm -hmm. And I began with The Odyssey and I ended and I ended with Toni Morrison, and I think 12 chapters. And it was like on the sixth chapter, Erica, that I stopped and I read what I had and I thought, holy smokes, I'm writing about the body wounded, dismembered, tattooed, uh, beaten. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm completely with you in this intimate engagement of the of the flesh yeah. with the fictions of the uh, of myth. Yeah, I, I talk a lot about the embodied soul. Beautiful. And the embodied mythopoetic process. Oh, that's fabulous. Oh no, we're on the same page on I think a number of levels right here. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Dennis, shall I call on more questions? What would you let's, like to let's do? take let's take two more questions and then I'll I'll push on and and then, but I, but I, I tell you, folks, I love putting things out on the table and then seeing how you're metabolizing it, making connections, and it just enriches the whole texture of the conversation. So, Andy, let's let's hear from two more folks, and then we'll I'll, I'll push on into the uh, into the PowerPoint. R. L. followed by Ed. Good. I'm curious about the statement about how um, myths. Hi. Hi, I'm curious about the statement about how myths tell us what we are, not just who we are. And I've only thought of myself as a who, not as a what. I wondered if yeah. you could talk about that. Yeah, it's really a good question. What am I? Is a question that that expands and deepens identity for me. Um, that who doesn't tap, it doesn't, it doesn't go far enough. What is, and I don't mean to sound in any Heideggerian way here, but what is the, what is the whatness of my who is, is the way that I would frame it. And it's kind of clumsy, but it has a, a touch of a poetic sensibility about it. The, the whatness of me. I think it's, I think it takes me closer to essence than uh, answering the question, who? Um, I'm going to suggest too that whatness is more ontological. In other words, it gets closer to being than uh, answering the question, who? So that's my distinction. And I'm open to, how are you thinking about it? 
this is a new concept for me, but um, I was questioning as you were talking about thinking this, is it, is it perhaps the self sense of being versus an outside definition, like the internal reality versus an outside definition that's applied who and what, but I'm not sure. I, I don't. But I, like, I like it. I like it. And I, and I, and I applaud you also for risking something here in the uncertainty of it. And I want to encourage you, stay with that. See where that takes you. Yeah. I think they're different questions, but I think they're really intertwined, to use uh, the weaving metaphor of uh, Erica of just a moment ago. Yeah. And they're really worth meditating on without, uh, without coming to some conclusion. Got it. No, close that box. I heard it click. No, but it stays open-ended. So that, I encourage you to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. And I think one more, I think Ed is going to speak and then I'll push on. Please, Ed. Okay, well, thank you, Dennis, for everything always. Uh, I would like to share two words or phrases uh, with our audience that are very important and reinforce the lessons that you're giving to us tonight. Oh, one is from the Greek and one is from the slattery. <laughs> okay, uh, the Greek uh, for our, for you and I are both Philellans and we draw from that tradition very much. The modern word for the novel, a work of fiction in Greek is mythistorema, mythistorema, which is a compound word that we would uh, translate as mythic history. Oh, beautiful. So a novel is a mythic history. Yep. And that's, this is the perfect analogy to, you, to your opening, Dennis, about a book. History wraps it on the outside and myth and calls it on the inside. But in fact, as you're beautifully demonstrating, mythic history is one. And we are one in how it unfolds, both temporally and archetypally. So I offer that. And I don't know if you're going to get to this, so I'm going to uh, reference your work. And this also uh, refers to Erica and other people's questions. Uh, friends out there, uh, I use Dennis's work a lot. We rely on each other's uh, research. Dennis has created a phrase that feels very important, and I hope we all learn it. And more than that, I hope our disciplines adopt it and use it. In Dennis's writing, he uses the phrase biomythic narrative. And mm -hmm. that came originally, I believe, from one of your articles on discovering the mythic dimensions of some of your own illnesses and physical ailments, That's showing right. how our biological un expression and unfolding reveals the gods that are inside us and the gods and the myths that are working through us. And when we can embrace our physical being, um, and as Erica's work does, more than that, through our physical being, get to the archetypal dimensions we're living, then we are creating a, a complete biomythic narrative or revealing our mythostorema, our, our mythic history. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's curative. I mean, I found, uh, I found that, uh, and Ed's referring to a, an essay that I wrote after um, really a serious bacterial infection that was really trying to put me away uh, with sepsis that uh, took me to the brink. When it was over, I, I tried to explain or describe it and I couldn't. I, I said, or something said to me, you, you have to see this illness and the recovery um, by means of mythic figures. And so I wrote the piece on, um, on Dionysus and Apollo, <clears throat> and it was published in the Jung Journal. Oh, it's been, it's been uh, several years now. But once I found the mythic corridor and wrote inside that corridor, I healed on a level that I didn't even know was still wounded or still ill. So, Ed, thank you for that. Yeah, and thank you for the word. Uh, 
In a book that I've read called The Craft of Zeus on, um, on the interplay of text and texture, uh, one of the things they uncovered, um, uh, let's see, The Craft of Zeus, Myths of Fabric and Weaving is the subtitle. It's brilliant. A guy by the name of Svenbro, S-V-E-N-B-R-O. That's his last name. And he co-authors it. And one of the striking uh, discoveries that they made is that they, they, they were able to somehow track that the notion of a narrative was inspired by a spider's web, by the structure of a spider's web. Um, and there's some relationships in the word textus and texture and text or story. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant uh, archeological and imaginative read. And I was thinking of Erica's word about the weaving, which is just the essence of story. To weave, the, to weave the fabrications of one's identity into a coherent narrative to share is mythopoesis uh, again. Yeah, so thank you, Ed, for that. Okay, let's see. I, I have 710, well, it's 810, your time. Let, let's go to the, um, to the PowerPoint presentation where I tried to gather a number of ways, additional ways of thinking about personal myth. And many of these um, appear in the writing myth book, but I've added, I've added to it. So let's see if we can do this. And give me a sec, because Andy has tutored me. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. Uh, and DennisPatrickSlattery.com, it, it gives a, a, a bit of a profile of who I am and what I've been up to and what I hope to continue. So many of the following characteristics of personal myth are in writing myth, mythic writing, plotting your personal story, but I've added to them. So there's the book. And here are the characteristics that I came up with as I wrote it and reflected on the wonderful participants uh, who were all my co-authors. I like, well, here, this one uh, is uh, so appropriate to where we were just speaking. A personal myth is a loom on which we weave the raw materials of daily experience into a coherent story. And that's from David Feinstein and Stanley Krippner's The Mythic Path, discovering the guiding stories of your past and creating a vision for your future. I just love the succinctness of this and the imagery of the loom. And I also find it interesting that the, <laughs> the first chapter of Moby Dick is called or entitled Loomings. And I think Ishmael is playing on what looms on the horizon, but I think also the fabrication of the narrative of the white whale itself is spun on a loom. It's woven on a loom. And the, the punning in Moby Dick is, uh, how should I say it, relentless and beautifully relentless. Another one. And folks, if any of you, as I go through these, it's not just to put check marks by it, but to think about them a little bit. If something occurs to you or you want to add to it, please be my guest. A personal myth molds. I try to, I try to be careful to the verbs, with the verbs that I use to capture something about the, the active quality of a personal myth. I, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think personal myth is a gerund. Remember those things that we learned in the seventh grade about a gerund being a verbal 
now. It, it moves, it, strat it, strat it stratifies between the two. It straddles between the two. So a personal myth molds my life events according to categories of awareness. And there's a whole discussion to be had about how each of us, as we develop, um, are so influenced by different categories of being aware of something, um, including oneself. So the personal myth is the molding of those life events according to the categories of, of awareness. And folks, it seems to me that those categories of awareness is, are what contribute to the events of our lives um, uh, attaining meaning, what they mean. The events themselves that happen to us on one level are meaningless. They don't have meaning until meaning is ascribed to them. And I think meanings are ascribed to the events in our lives by the categories of awareness that we take them in. And I don't want to use the word process, but um, um, bake them, uh, uh, create, create, uh, create a fabrication out of them, uh, fabricate something. Yeah, that's, that's the sense that I'm trying to capture here. Another. A personal myth reveals that what I believe about myself and the world what will influence what I believe to be true. So in the last maybe year and a half, maybe two years, I, because of the strangeness of the world that we're living in today, where many people don't know what to believe anymore, and disinformation, misinformation, uh, competing voices, competing uh, the competition for a particular reality to be trademarked has brought the whole phenomena of belief uh, forefront. And so I've been writing on what I'm calling in an umbrella way, the mythology of belief, which takes us into prejudices, assumptions, um, uh, yeah, intuitions, uh, speculations, and what seems to be up for grabs today in many quarters is the nature of reality itself. Reality seems to be up for grabs. And depending on the narrative that becomes most persuasive, that will influence a certain number of people to adopt it and to identify with it and to become it. So I lean on that because this was written well before I became fascinated by the mythology of belief itself. A personal myth is flexible, it's protean, it's elastic so long as it remains organic and living. A personal myth reveals a resiliency that I think is a witness to its vitality. So a, a personal myth is a living organic entity. It's not a concept, uh, it's not an idea, uh, exclusively, but it's a, it's a flexible, organic, embodied 
because I think the, it's, it's, uh, it's incarnated, it's incarnational, and it reveals a resiliency that is a witness to its vitality. No, let me see if it's the next one. No, it's coming up in two. I should have had it next, but uh, let, me, let me keep moving here. And uh, I'll look at the other side. When a, when a living myth becomes cadaverous, when it suffers uh, sclerosis, when it becomes arthritic. But right now here, a personal myth is always in process of constructing a model of reality. And by that, I mean a guiding set of values and often twistings of the normative. It, 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 um, it can distort, it can torque uh, the normative in order to reveal something that's been hidden. And uh, there's more than one writer that uh, has uh, suggested that this is what art gives us. It gives us distortions, exaggerations, so that we can see something new or see something old in a very novel, unique way. But what is uh, normative has got to be torqued. Flannery O'Connor, one of my favorite Southern one of my favorite fiction writers, a uh, Southern fiction writer, made this claim. And when she was lecturing, I think in Minnesota, when her lupus subsided enough that she could travel and give talks on uh, fiction and poetry, she wrote the first two, three letters of the alphabet in big letters on the board in front of the students. And she turned to the group that she was talking to and said, this is what the artist has to do. They have to exaggerate. Now she's talking about the fiction writer, but she said they have to exaggerate because they know that their audience is blind or almost blind. And so they're to get capture their awareness, to get their attention. Uh, you have to write letters in grotesque forms, and she's a, a just a master at the grotesque because of what it uncovers. And, it, and the grotesque can be seen when things are twisted out of shape, and when things are twisted out of shape, oftentimes then the myth that resides and is living in it reveals itself in ways that if it's normative remains hidden. I hope that makes sense to you. That when we just, when we distort something and ex or exaggerate it, it draws our attention to it. And boy, I mean, advertising knows this, news media know this as a way to get one's attention but one can also do it artistically in order to capture one's awareness and uh, get one to think about something in a new way. Okay. Yeah, this is the one that I meant a moment ago. A personal myth can harden or calcify from an organic living element into a rigid, dogmatism that is closer to a cadaver than to a malleable life principle. See that calcification leads, can lead, often leads to a rigid dogmatism. So now one is fixed in place and what drops out in that dogmatism is conversation an authentic back and forth because the dogmatic imagination says there's really no room for other uh, opinions because they're wrong, because my dogma asserts it, that other options are 
simply unavailable to it. And I use the term cadaver consciously because it may look like it's alive, but in fact has no life principle any longer in it. And one of its qualities is that it rigidifies and almost petrifies, so it can't move. A personal myth is always related to my organic bodily being and emanates in part from my incarnated presence. And we were speaking about that uh, just a little bit ago uh, with uh, Erica's uh, uh, observations. Joseph Campbell suggests that biology and mythology are of a piece. Yeah, that psyche is always psyche and body. Um, being present is being embodied. Being embodied allows for us to be present to ourselves and to others. Uh, and this is a little recapitulation of something I said earlier, but I'm going to use it and repeat it anyhow. A personal myth is a way or a via into the aesthetic, poetic, mystical, and transcendent qualities of my story identity. Yeah. And I think my storied identity contains the whatness and the whoness of my being. It's both. It's both the what and the who. To return to uh, what was asked just a little while ago. A personal myth is like a fulcrum. And I think I may have used this already, but I'm going to repeat it. Uh, because I pulled it from the intro. A personal myth is like a fulcrum balancing two realities. The external world I meet day to day and the inner psychic world that has its own objective nature. Now, um, that ability to adapt both to the interior ecology of each of us and the external world that we have some control over um, every day is the very definition of, a of, of an alive personal mythology because it has to do with adaptability. Can I remain flexible enough? Can I be uh, fluid enough to bend or yield when that is necessary, and also to stand up straight when that is necessary as well. So the myth that we are and are developing helps us in that adaptability that's ongoing. A personal myth is in large measure the consequence, and I think I've used this already, but uh, okay. It's in large measure the consequence of how I structure my images of reality based on patterns that have developed over years, even decades, from my life experiences. And one more, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna pause. A personal myth embodies an ongoing quest, and every quest harbors a question or is motivated by a central question. Each of us, I think, must find that question on our own journey and not someone else's. And I think Rumi was gently and poetically um, uh, asking us to remember 
not to spend our lives inside other people's narratives, but to unfold, and I love the verb, unfold one's own myth. Campbell, echoing Rumi, made this claim in writing about medieval epics. First of all, the hero, heroine, must hear the call. That's first. If the call is not heard, nothing happens. But when one hears the call, one has an option. One can heed it or one can refuse it. And in Hero with a Thousand Faces, he gives over four pages to what, it, what happens when one refuses the call. Once one hears the call, heeds it, and yields to it, then one, and this is often um, played down in that series of uh, Campbell's thinking, one must give oneself over to something larger than who they are. Because simply to give oneself over to something just like oneself, one is not on a hero's quest, according to Campbell. If one uh, agrees to these steps, then one must seek to enter the woods where there is no sign that anyone else has gone into the woods <clears throat> in that particular place. Because if one is seeing that there is a kind of opening in this thickness of the woods, then one is in danger of following the mythic path of another. And one's own path will never be traversed. So he writes in Hero with a Thousand Faces, enter where the, wood, the woods are thickest, where it looks almost impossible to break into this barrier of uh, branches and tree trunks and, and foliage. And that's the very place that one's myth is leading one. I love that idea that that it's, it, it's in the place where there is no path that the true questing is taking place. Not when the path is kind of clear and there's some street signs and stop signs and just go this way. There's no quest. There is simply tourism, if that happens. If one allows it to happen. Okay, so let me... Let me stop there, yeah. And let's see if uh, there's some observations or insights from uh, some of you folks. Go ahead, you are. You'll need to unmute. Here yes. Hi. Hi. Um, you say your name, first name. Uh, I think he actually said it uh, correct. Yoav uh, or Yoav, either one. Yoav. Yoav. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, hopefully, I I can. Uh, um, explain my my questions uh my question correctly so i work with uh a lot of people that actually are i think not hearing the call uh wanting very much to hear a call and are not and that actually um turns out to be uh just leaving them in a depressed state for a very long time and so um 
Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether uh, the desire for a myth and keep uh, the wait, the long wait for a myth actually can create uh, a sense of despair. Um, uh, certainly, I want to have a, a hero's journey or a journey. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and this goes, I think, uh, to our society where now where everybody wants to be famous, everybody wants to be the star of the show. Uh, and that can create a lot of uh, a lot of misery where people don't find themselves to be the heroes that they hope that they would be, I guess, in childhood. And I have a hard time kind of uh, contending with it and knowing how to work with people be, uh, uh, with that, because is it... Um, kind of propping uh, people into hoping for something that they may never achieve. Obviously, it's about, I guess, fi finding their own journey. But how heroic does this journey need to be, I guess, is a bit of a question. The, the understanding that I have, and that's really, boy, what work you're doing. Wow. That's, uh, it's magnificent what you're, what you're allowing yourself to do to help others find what they might really be wanting to quest for. The, the, the Greek understanding of the hero, as I have uh, learned it, is it's, it's, the hero is an individual who either leads or suffers. And of course, sometimes it's not or, but and. It's someone who leads and suffers. And I've always been interested in the suffering part of the heroic, which is a mellowing and, and humbling and... Um, you know, a pulling one down, especially from in the Greek tragedies, from a sense of hubris, that inflated sense that I'm, because I'm a king, I am uh, right next to being a god. Um, yeah, these are, I'm making a couple of observations, but boy, I, um, that's hard. That's hard. And, and the, the waiting um, or the expectation or the, um, the hope is, you know, in, in poetry, that's what lyric poetry is about. It's, it's, it can be about lamenting, but on the other side, lyric poetry is about the yearning for something. And can I attain it or not? The yearning doesn't give a hoot whether you can actually achieve it. But that sense of yearning carries so much affective energy. And, but to yearn with mm, the uncertainty of can this be, can this yearning be consummated? In some fashion, it doesn't have to be sexual, it doesn't have to be another, but something is consummated in one because one is yearning. I mean, that's it's like a sweet suffering, you know. I, I, I don't want to sentimentalize it, but there's a, there's a sweetness about the yearning. And uh, as I had this wonderful teacher, and she was my mentor for 45 years and worked out the, the, the genre terrain, which is the terrain of the psyche. The, the third moment in, your, in uh, lyric poetry was lamentation. With, I'm, I'm lamenting what's been lost. And even the, lamenting the loss of the suffering that maybe one experienced you know, earlier in life or last Thursday. Um, so... I don't know if that's helpful, but I just, I heard the lyric uh, tone in your describing uh, this immense feeling that 
one hopes it doesn't lead to despair because yearning, yearning mm, seems to mitigate despair. As I'm just thinking about it uh, from your, from your uh, uh, illustrations. Yeah. I hope that, I hope any of that or some of that makes sense that might be valuable to you. Oh, yeah, it was beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, a pleasure. And thank you for what you're doing. I mean it. Thank you. Go ahead, Alan. So I um, am teaching a course in Alan. an alternate high school here in Holyoke, Massachusetts on superheroes as our modern mythology. Mm -hmm. And I have come to really love the comics. And That's great. Uh, the, That's great. the kinds of heroes' journeys that these comic characters are going through is just exciting to me. Yes. Um, and they, uh, all the themes you mentioned of uh, suffering and uh, feeling like a total weirdo and um, um, deciding, losing all their powers and losing their um, uh, arrogance and so on. The, the Thor, for example, is this arrogant god and he gets thrown to earth and loses his powers and he, he has a huge comeuppance. Dr. Strange is another one who is this arrogant surgeon who just treats everybody like a dirt. And he ends up in an auto accident and his hand is destroyed. And now he's, he has no way of being a surgeon anymore. Oh. So the comics are doing this right now for our yes. world today. And the kids are, you know, leaning into this. So I recommend everyone uh, get into this. And I'm 84. So here, if I can handle it, I, anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the um, Ellen. I love the excitement in your voice as you talk about the, the 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 heroes themselves, but also the students. And I couldn't agree more. They are. I'm just reading and hearing <clears throat> so many positive things about these about the kids that are coming up and have oh. have a consciousness of we're really screwing the earth up and. They're demonstrating at, at ages where I just wanted a girlfriend and that would have done it for me. And they're socially conscious. And, yeah. and just to share with you, I remember when Wonder Woman came out, I went with my uh, granddaughter, who's now uh, three granddaughters, but uh, Chris was 20. She's 21 now. Oh, it's been, I don't know, five, six years. And I was so absorbed in Wonder Woman, and occasionally I'd look over at Chris and her face, and she was in a trance. She was just, I mean, talk about that look on someone's face that you realize they are 110% attending to this narrative on the screen. Yeah. So, and, and so the discussions are good. I'm, I'm supposing, uh, Alan, for, for you in the classroom reading these with the students. Yeah. We, we watch a lot of films together. Oh, good. That's you great. Know, and one of the problems I have now that we're, we're back together in uh, personal is I can't hear the kids. <laughs> oh, the gosh, mass. yes. Yes. It drives me crazy. Yeah. So you're face to face, obviously, with yeah. them now. And one of the other things that's happening, there's com there are comics now about Ms. Marvel, who is a Pakistani 16-year-old girl from Jersey City. Oh, okay. And um, Riri Williams, a black girl who has is so brilliant, she figures out how to make a suit like Tony Stark and Iron Man. <laughs> And then there's uh, America Chavez, who is a Puerto Rican girl. So first of all, a lot of young women in this, plus all kinds of diversity. And it's just exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so great. It's, I just, I'm, I'm 
I'm lamenting a little here in Texas where there is a movement uh, by a fellow in Fort Worth who's a senator who has uh, uh, amassed an 850 titles of books that he wants purged from all public schools in the state of Texas because, and you'll love this, we want to eviscerate anything that would make a student feel uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. and challenged. I mean, this is the rhetoric of these poorly educated uh, political figures. And the, the list is uh, available online, but they're about the, 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 the Pakistani or the transgender or the fluid gender. And so I, read an, I wrote an op-ed piece that was published last week on uh, the relationship between lying and innocence. And they're, 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 the senator is trying to make a platform for himself by this uh, spectacle of uh, banning books. And most uh, the, the consensus is that this fellow has probably not read two of them. But the titles smack of difference and otherness. So let's get them out of the schools. And Ellen, the, the, the pitiful part of it is how many parents want to keep their child in the bubble, both at school and then at home. So, so Texas is on or at that figure is on the other side of all this diversity that could offer opportunities for rich discussions and teaching teaching young people tolerance for another point of view. I mean, the learning that could take place in that. But this uh, kind of pornographic move to abolish these books is, uh, uh, is atrocious. Anyhow, I didn't mean to get off on that, but I'm so happy that you're and your students are so engaged in these rich archetypes that are just assuming a different format. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Ricky. Please. Hi. Um, kind Hi, of Ricky. Hi. Kind of continuing on that, on the same vein, is I feel like in our society, we're really up against trying to create a new myth as far as um, who uh, can be in charge of the, the country and, or and more than just the U.S., but the authority, um, is I feel like what we're struggling against is, is like the white European male as being the myth, as the trusted leader, as, as the one who's uh, entitled and has um, the, the right way to approach the world. Yes. And uh, I really felt this in a friend that I had who, um, who I guess maybe is not a friend anymore, um, mm -hmm. who was a very big Trump supporter. And I really, as I was, would uh, disagree with him and talk with him, I could really feel how deep this myth goes in him, like yes. that I'm a white man and I'm really, I'm the one who should be in charge. I know what I'm doing. I helped create this country. I was one of the pioneers. It was like his ancestors were coming through too. And yes. so I was just curious yes. if you had any uh, thoughts or feedback or maybe just support for... Uh, for trying to create a new myth or adapt now, the old one into what integrated into something that will work for all of us. I'm reading now a, a revised version. I think it's Richard Hughes. I, I pulled some of my books over here and it's, um, oh heck, it's about the five myths that America promotes time and again. And he revised a 2007 version of Myths in America uh, to this new one, 2018, because he left out the myth of white supremacy in the five. And when um, a mentor of his heard him give a talk at a conference, about here are the five myths that guide the American psyche. 
when he finished and everybody applauded him, his wonderful speaker, and he came and he sat down next to his mentor. And he said, that was wonderful, but I'm telling you, there's a huge gap. And he said, where's the gap? He says, you never said a word about the myth of white supremacy. And he thought, holy smoke. So he revised the book so he could deal with that, uh, as he says, more primal of the American, uh, of the five American myths. Now it's six. Uh, Richard Hughes, myths, uh, myths America lives by, H-U-G-H-E-S, 2018. And he's brilliant. Great. Yeah, I wrote down his name. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and and see, the, the thing that was so fascinating for him was, holy smokes, I'm so steep in the myth of white supremacy, I couldn't see it. Right. Yes. I mean, just brilliant. <laughs> and when he saw it, he said, I can't let my book stand anymore. I've got mm -hmm. to revise it and and bring this in. So he's he's brilliant. Anyhow, yeah. Great. I hope that helps. I'm, oh, yes. Thank you. I'm just learning a ton from this guy. Okay. Thank you. Dennis, Dennis, yes. We have a little under 15 minutes left. How many more questions? Let, gosh, I just hate to cut anybody off. Let's, let's hear one more. I mean... To be honest with you, I mean, I I had a couple of meditations, but we're not going to, I was going to present them, not to have us work on them. Um, uh, let's hear from, let's hear from the other folks. I really, I really love this interaction with people. And if, if what I presented or what one of them, one of the folks have said triggers other thinking, I, I, I prefer to go with that. So let's stay with it, Andy. Okay. Susan, yeah. go ahead, please. Please. Hey, Dennis. Hi. Hi, Susan. <laughs> so I was thinking about uh, Yoav's um, question. So I, I want to make a comment about that, but I also want to ask you a question. You know, I think that when we're called – and we have a sense of that calling that we can also sometimes deeply in, in a deeply intuitive way know what we're going to have to sacrifice. Good. And Great. when I think of the suffering, I think of what on so many different levels we're going to have to give up and let go of. Yeah. And somewhere in us, we know that. Yes. So an invitation to ask, you know, our patients, our clients, our analysands, what would you have to sacrifice? Yeah. And I think the other deep knowing that we have is that this journey, if we are really going to go into that realm, is going to be scary as hell sometimes. You, you know, that we know that when we enter into that realm, there are a lot of forces and energies and <laughs> that that are going to have to be confronted. No. And somewhere in us, I think we know that, too. Yes. So sometimes we can romanticize the process when we think it's when we're thinking about it intellectually, like I'm in, but also... <laughs> <laughs> when you're really in it, when you're really in those woods, yeah. wow, that's a that's very it becomes very embodied and very real. Yes, and we don't yes. always know what's around the corner. Yeah. Yes. So I want to, if Beautiful. I don't want to take too much, but just to shift, I have a question for you, and I think this speaks to the last question and, and sort of the cultural phenomenon that we're living right now. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if you could say something about maybe the difference between heeding the call and following your bliss. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the bumper sticker <laughs> that we saw for years uh, was follow your bliss. But um Slattery, another Irishman, wanted to put next to it 
a second bumper sticker that said, and tend to your blisters. <laughs> because any following of one's bliss is going to create blisters. I'm, I'm having fun with it, but with a serious point that you are bringing up, you're going to suffer from, from following that bliss. And, and Campbell got romanticized with the bliss, which was really the fifth sheath in Buddhist thought that had to do with transcending opposites. But it got commercialized into, you know, do your own thing. And it was really bastardized. And he does say in the hero's journey that Phil Cousineau uh, put together and edited and worked with Campbell. Uh, and Phil is a, a good friend, and we have talks about Campbell, is um, Campbell said, towards the end of it, follow your bliss, but, but be prepared for the pains or the suffering, I'm paraphrasing him, that is going to attend that bliss seeking. Mm -hmm. So he had no uh, sentimental uh, notions about if you take this on, mm -hmm. what it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And only you will know how to fill the ledger out. Mm -hmm. This is what I gained, and this is what I had to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, think the, I think the follow your bliss notion as, as a romantic notion has also been a bit co-opted now if it feels good do it do it yeah exactly right yeah exactly right there's a there's a poem by rilke i wonder if we could look at it and then come back I, I yeah because it's so on point to where we are right here from what you were asking so let me go back and i noticed that somebody had put in the chat that they would have enjoyed the meditation. So let me show you. Uh, let me skip. Let me skip. Uh, gosh, I had a lot, didn't I? That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here was one. Given what we have just surveyed, and of course, I've skipped a bunch, as various qualities of a personal myth, I was going to see if we could write for 10 or 12 minutes on what you consider your fundamental story. That is the story that defines you most certainly now. You know, that may change in six months. So another way to ask it is, what is the main plot of your life? That is one that gives your life coherence. Uh, and then there was one on assumptions that I was going to share. Uh, you know, but but here's the here's the Rilke poem. L let's look at it. It's a short poem, and I just think it's so profound. <clears throat> and don't let the title throw you, because of course sometimes a woman stands up during supper. But he was writing in a historical uh, context. Now look what happens here with two mythologies. Sometimes a man stands up during supper and walks outdoors and keeps on walking because of a church that stands somewhere in the east. And his children say blessings on him as if he were dead. And another man who remains inside his house dies there inside the dishes, <clears throat> and in the glasses, so that his children <clears throat> have to go far out into the world toward that same church which he forgot. And then I was going to see if we had time <clears throat> for you to write on that. <clears throat> Because the poem reveals two contrasting ways that one may respond to the call of myth or 
to the summons of destiny. <clears throat> and then this is the core of the matter. What might each of you identify as your church in the East, which is traditionally the direction of a new day, new life? It may be that fits here. I think it does. <clears throat> and then describe your church in the East when you were called and under what circumstances. And then what have been the consequences of your answering or refusing the call? I find it fascinating what Rilke shows us, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> about the children of the parent who stands up during supper and walks outdoors and keeps on walking. And one of the women participants, <clears throat> and, I, <clears throat> and I use hers uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the writing myth book, excuse me, <clears throat> tells the story <clears throat> of one day with a suitcase, walks out of the house, leaving her husband and three children, and never returns never returned. It was so powerful to read it. And she presented it. <clears throat> and she said, no, don't use my name, but you can use my story. Because I'm one of those women who stood up during supper, the time of the gathering of the family. And she said, I walked outdoors, and I kept on going, and I've never returned. Look what happens to the mythology of the student, of, I'm sorry, not, of the children of the second man who plays it safe, remains in his house, and then is suffocated by his possessions, the dishes and the glasses. So that the children, it seems to me, have to put their myth on hold in order to complete the myth of the parent so that his children have to go far out. It seems like they have to go farther than the father would have had to go to find his church in the East. Now I'm giving my interpretation and you're free to take it or reject it or amplify your thinking so that they have to go to the church that he forgot and then they can begin their own journey. Now, one could suggest that in going to fulfill the Father's church in the East, they are, in fact, fulfilling something of their own myth. And, you know, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's an option. But I love the tightness and the clarity and the simplicity of his language and the profundity of living a life where you respond to the myth and hear the call of your destiny. And then one who says, uh, maybe a little too risky, I think I'm gonna stay home. And the burden that that puts on the next generation. And I think we're, we can feel that in today's uh, world. Yeah, so I'm gonna back out uh, and then let's take, can we, can we take uh, a, a, a couple more questions? If you don't mind, I don't know if, where the time is or if we can go over a few. So Andy, help me out here. Uh, not my call, I, I guess. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, uh, my oh. clock says 8.03 or something, but I, go ahead, I would. Dennis, Dennis I'm, I'm the president, so I get to call it. So you can oh, go please. ahead for a little while. Go oh, ahead. Keep, keep, thank you, Erica. Uh, and th thank you for the for the correction too. It, it, that's important. So uh, let's hear from Chuck. Chuck, hi please. Dennis. Thank you. Hi. I think Mary was ahead of me. So oh, I'll, I'm sorry. But Mary, go first, and I'll go after. Thank you. I, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mary, please. Hi there. Th thank you so much for this evening and this generosity. Um, I 
I am, um, you know, as I, I work in and out of uh, what you would, what I'm calling now a cadaver culture um, mm. with a lot of mm. suffering and, and inequity. And um, I've been, you know, uh, trying to figure out this relationship between my own personal myth, of course, and the cultural structural overlay uh, yes. you know, in, in working in a, in a very toxic, high crime, high poverty, you know, food desert, broken families. Um, the question, what I wanted to ask you to talk about is this journey involves the other side. It involves nurturing resiliency and hope. Yes. And can you offer some, I've read Verona cast and um, can you, can you offer some reflections on this reclamation that is so essential to restore joy, even if what I'm calling heavy joy, that's mm. in my own, what I'm working with, with uh, families. Um, can you offer some, some thoughts on this reclamation? The two, uh, I'll try, the two areas that I work on uh, in myself today in, in order to cut down or, or dilute uh, some of the vitriol mm. and resentment I feel about the injustices today mm -hmm. are uh, forgiveness and gratitude. And I, I wish I had the name of the author who wrote a magnificent book entitled simply Forgiveness that mm -hmm. I read years ago and I found my notes to his book just recently. And I've started reading them in my morning meditation. Mm -hmm. And then the book by Karen Armstrong on, on gratitude. Is it on gratitude? Yes. Yeah, Karen Armstrong. And then um, there's a wonderful Austrian Benedictine brother mm -hmm. by the name of Brother um, David Steindl Rast. S T E I N D L hyphen R A S T. And mm -hmm. I read him every morning, and his book is called Gratefulness. Um, the Heart of Prayer, mm. I think is the subtitle. Gratefulness, The okay. Heart of Prayer. I know where they are on my bookshelves, but I don't want to. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be jumping up and down and, and grabbing them, but I, I think I'm giving you enough information. And these are three. Um, and the other one that I read that I've, I've read now for 13 or 14 years is the Buddhist, the American Buddhist uh, monk, Pima Chodron. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I, I just love her Buddhist psychology approach. And the one that I'm rereading and my wife is listening to on Audible is When Things Fall Apart. Yeah. And she's just, you know, you go back and you, mm -hmm. you, you read a chapter and you go back and read it and other things kind yeah. of push out the things you underline because they want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't do that kind of centering work in the morning, I don't have a good day. It's the holding of the two things at the same time. It's the the holding of of this joy and res and hope yes. um, through you know at this and and also the the bearing of the weight. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the thing that uh, one other item that Sandy and I uh, are trying to hold each other to is watching less news. Yes just not watching it uh, because it just is so unsettling, but one has to be in touch. So that's a fine 
that's a fine one that she and I continue to work on. Yeah. And just, you know, finding really wonderful films on Netflix or Amazon instead of spending that time watching the news. That has also been almost like an antibody. Yeah. So I hope those few help. Thank they're you. Just, yeah, thank you. And they're so they're so wonderful to reread. Yes. That's the other part of it that's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Go ahead, Chuck. Thank you, Andy. Dennis, thank you so much for your wonderful oh, just all of those the, the, the all things about personal myth. Thank I'm you, still Chuck. formulating this question, so yeah. I hope I can be clear, and that is personal myth and moral injury. Yes. Um, coming a veteran coming from the military, you have a certain mythos, and all of a sudden your moral compass is gone. Yes. How does one, and, and I don't want to frame it this way, but it's the only way I can come up with right at the moment is how does one recover myth? How does one rebuild, rework, incorporate things back into build yeah. myth to move forward? Because your one particular item that really struck me was personal, personal myth can harden or calcify from an organic living element into a rigid dogmatism that is close to a cadaver, then to a malleable life principle. And that's what that feels like. Yes. And so I know these relate. It's, it's, so my question is, how do you repair it? How do you build it? What can we do? That's, so I'll leave you with that. Yeah. And thank you, uh, Chuck. And you use the term moral injury. And I've, um, uh, and here again, it's the title of a book, and I've written on moral injury, and the man who wrote it works with Native American wisdom and has taken in one of the Native American tribes, like wisdom mottos, which is, I am as you are. In other words, there's no separation between the two of us. And I'm, I'm, Chuck, I'm sorry that I'm not bringing up this guy's last name, but the title of his book is Moral Injury. And it's brilliant in reclamation. I like your word. And that's for, and then he, he, um, he lays out a series of steps that can be done in community where people voice, all right, what is the injury? Give it language, get it up on stage so we can see it and we can respond to it as we would respond to a, a character in a play. And then um, a program to reverse the wounds of moral injury. And I think, boy, are we, I just feel we're in such a national place of moral injury to one another uh, on so many. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm not going to locate it. I know where it is on the bookshelf, but if, does that help? I know I'm being a little vague, but the title, Reynolds, Oh, I'm not going to bring it up, but I found uh, writing about it and presenting. I presented the paper at the Austin Friends of Jung a couple of years ago, and I didn't know how cathartic it would be to voice where I felt morally injured. And I said to the yes. group at the beginning, I'm going to probably offend some of you, but I really can't care about that right now. I want to put this injury out on the table. And the uh, group was magnificently receptive because they're all morally wounded too. Yeah, exactly. And so the, and so the next day's workshop or writing meditations were around 
how can we give it language? And then how can we pull back from it? So it's not, it's not so dogmatically in control. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank I you. Hope That's that a helped, lot. Doug. Yeah. My, my Thank pleasure. You. Yes. Thank you. We'll Joe. turn it back to Erica Lorenz, president of the Young Association. Erica, you're muted. And did you, I can't hear you, yeah. Andy. Can you say what you said, Andy? Uh, just turning it back to you, Erica. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't hear, I didn't hear you. Okay. I, I think we need to wrap it up for this evening. So. Oh. Thank you. It went way too fast. And but I, I just want to thank all of you. I, I love the participatory interpretive uh, model of uh, exchanging. And then everyone's learning. So my gratitude to all of you and to Erica for inviting me in. And I can't believe that it's, well, here it's 8.15. Uh, I, I think I went into a time warp. Anyhow. <laughs> well, thank you, Dennis, for being able to respond to our wonderful community that loves to participate and loves to ask questions and think and share things. So thank it's you. Terrific. Uh, thank a you. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Pleasure. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs>